Uh, thanks, Jim, uh, for a brilliant presentation. Um, my name is Zohim Chandani. Uh, I'm a quantum application engineer here at NVIDIA, uh, based out of London, UK. Um, previously, I was at Rigetti Computing, uh, thinking about uh, designing various quantum algorithms and how to implement them on quantum computers, superconducting quantum um, computers. Uh, but today, I'm here to talk to you about CODA. So let's get started. Um, so quantum computing today is, is focused on relatively small scale algorithmic development, right? And to that extent, a bunch of Pythonic frameworks have been developed. Um, you may have heard of some of them today or, or actually use some of them in tutorials. Uh, we have CERC by the team at Google, Qiskit with IBM, uh, Penny Lane by the team at Xanadu. If we're to think of academic institutions, we can think of um, the Quest simulator developed by the team at the University of Oxford. And these are all critical. And without them, we're very unlikely to discover quantum algorithms for quantum advantage in the near future. And these are so critical that NVIDIA's kind of first foray or venture into the quantum computing space was to build KU Quantum, which um, accelerates a bunch of these Pythonic frameworks. But what we then noticed was that there's a big gap between experimenting with these algorithms um, and the fact that a lot of the uh, GPU accelerated scientific computing applications of today are the most likely candidates for future quantum accelerated applications. And that transition from small scale algorithm development uh, by quantum physicists to application development by domain scientists is why we needed a platform that delivers this high performance, delivers interoperability with applications and programming paradigms, and is familiar to domain scientists. And if you think back to time before 2006, NVIDIA has some experience within this space, right? Before the launch of CUDA, there were a bunch of domain scientists leveraging GPUs to accelerate their work, but very few. And you may ask why, and that's because they had to program in graphics, shader APIs, or GPU assembly. And from this perspective, what NVIDIA did by launching CUDA is to usher in a revolution in accessibility for, 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 for a lot of people, and particularly for domain scientists. So to that extent, what we worked on was CODA, which is quantum optimized device architecture, which I'd like to introduce to you today. And what is CODA, right? So it's this hybrid quantum classical compute platform, um, which addresses the challenges facing application developers like myself, um, who are looking to incorporate con uh, quantum acceleration into some of their workflows. And whether that's through a, a, a quantum simulator or a quantum processor, um, uh, which, CODA, uh, which CODA supports uh, both natively. Secondly, CODA allows one to kind of quickly move between running all or some parts of their applications um, on a classical or a quantum emulated um, or quantum hardware. Um, it includes this kernel-based programming model uh, within C++ and Python implementations. Behind the scenes, it has a compiler tool chain built in um, and a standard library, which I'll show a couple of examples of, of commonly used quantum algorithmic primitives like QAOA or VQE, for example. And with CODA, what NVIDIA is doing is it's kicking off this revolution in developer accessibility, allowing scientists to kind of leverage quantum acceleration um, and also use tight, uh, and tightly couple GPUs uh, with their workflows. So let's kind of dig into some of the features that I've been discussing. So firstly, it, it kind of interoperates with standard language parallelism that most of you may be aware of with like OpenMP, OpenACC, CUDA, for example, um, to allow users to kind of incrementally add quantum acceleration where it makes sense into their existing applications. Coda is QPU agnostic. And from the start, from the very beginning, we've been working with um, hardware providers from across the qubit technology spectrum, atoms, strapped ions, superconducting quantum architecture, photonics, for example. And we've been collaborating also with a bunch of software companies. Um, Zapata, for example, we've been working with to kind of tightly integrate Coda uh, into building algorithms for the future. And of course, supercomputing centers like NERSC itself um, to kind of test and deploy Coda to thousands of scientific computing developers around the world. So I wanna kind of take some time to dig into some of the technical um, design primitives um, about how one uses a CODA quantum kernel. So what CODA does is it follows this annotated kernel approach with um, typed function objects um, like lambdas, which allows users to kind of um, uh, define functions that are quite generic, which can be reused, right? So here we see this example, example with a variational quantum algorithm or a VQE, where, um, where the programmer can define a variational quantum circuit uh, and use that as an input uh, to algorithmic libraries, specifically this VQE called right at the bottom over here. 
right? We see how easy it is to kind of construct this uh, built-in type, the spin-up type, uh, where you can define a Hamiltonian which you want to variationally minimize, uh, which is the which is the purpose of what the variational quantum eigen solver algorithm does. And the overall kind of efficiency of this program, right, which is a couple of lines or, or at max um, six to seven lines, uh, which you can see here, um, allows a scientist to kind of go from a parameterized ansatz to a Hamiltonian that they want to minimize to run on a on a, to run this algorithm to run the VQE algorithm on a DGX platform or on a physical QPU of their choice. And that's what really stands out here with this CODA approach. And this snippet that I'm sharing here, the code snippet, um, is what truly demonstrates kind of the underlying philosophy of CODA and why, I've been, why we've been working so hard on CODA. And that's to kind of provide concepts to describe these quantum code expressions like VQE and QAOA, for example, and then have the ability to execute them on whatever platform of your choice um, that you desire. We've seen some code. Let's kind of look at some numbers. Um, I know in the tutorial that Jin Sung was sharing, we wanted to kind of uh, show how, how GPU acceleration uh, speeds things up um, by 100x or something like that. Um, but here, what we're looking at is some preliminary results um, on implementing a VQE algorithm on CODA um, in comparison to a leading Pythonic framework also running on an A100 uh, uh, GPU, right? So what we're doing here is we're comparing GPU to GPU. And when running in an emulated environment, what CODA does is it leverages cool quantum behind the scenes as a backend. And here we're seeing that with 20 qubits, we're already getting something like 287x speed up, right? That's quite significant. And that, as a quantum application engineer, speeds up my workflow quite significantly and allows me, and, and allows me to test and iterate my development and my ideas um, in a rapid fashion. Here is another example of a kite algorithm, quantum imaginary time evolution. And this algorithm um, is intrinsically hybrid and iterative. And by hybrid, I mean it goes from CPU slash GPU uh, to QPU um, with each iteration depending um, on, solving a linear, uh, on solving a linear system from a previous iteration, right? So clearly this is an opportunity for GPU, QPU interoperability. And this code snippet here demonstrates just that where we're using CODA to kind of, uh, to figure out an expectation value for a set of Pauli operators, and then using that um, as the input to QSolver, uh, which solves this linear system for us, outputs a bunch of parameters, which we then input into the next iteration of our, um, of our, of our kite algorithm. With CODA, you can intrinsically, um, kind of uh, intrinsically um, uh, asynchronously um, uh, execute tasks on all available QPUs um, if that's your backend of choice or various GPUs if you um, if you wanted to do that as well. And we're, we're re releasing kind of a bunch of multi-GPU, multi-node uh, support in the, in the near future, which um, Jin Sung uh, already spoke about. But in this example, what you can see here is we're simulating a hydrogen chain using a v variational quantum eigen solver. And on this slide, what we see here is that we have almost near perfect strong scaling, right? Um, up to around four simulated Q QPUs of 28 qubits each um, on this DGX A100 box that we've been using. And this, this kind of work just scratches the surface of um, the things that we've been exploring with CODA. Um, and we're excited to kind of continue uh, this development further. I wanted to um, change direction a little and talk about some of the work I've been doing recently with quantum GANs. Um, have we got any questions? Nope, we don't. Okay, let me just share my slides again. Um, cool, so I've been using CODA recently to test out um, generative adversarial, uh, quantum generative adversarial networks. But before I do that, I wanted to introduce what GANs are, generative adversarial networks. And this is this algorithm within classical machine learning. And if I was to kind of draw a, a, a very rough analogy as to what a GAN does, is imagine you have some real source of data and um, the task here in this case is uh, to plot the Wigner function of optical quantum states, for example. So the real source of data is this fault state. Uh, the job of the generator is to kind of um, generate some some source of data and in, in, in at the start of training, it generates some random sources of data. 
And the job of the discriminator is to discriminate whether the data it's presented with has come from the real source or the fake source. So as you allow training to progress between the generator and the discriminator, the generator starts to get better and better at uh, the distribution it generates and eventually uh, is able to kind of maximally perplex the discriminator where the discriminator can't tell whether the source of data it's presented with has come from the real source or the fake source, right? So that's where you terminate your GAN training where the probability of the discriminator to discriminate correctly is exactly a half. And this is again, um, a kind of a, a neural network architecture image of what a GAN is, right? You input some random noise at the start, you have a bunch of neural networks, two in particular, a generator and a discriminator, and they're kind of adversaries against each other um, where the generator tries to create statistics that mimic the true data distribution and the discriminator um, tries to determine whether it's presented with the real or the fake distribution. And they're, they're adversaries of each other, they're kind of pitted against each other um, and they continue this game until Nash equilibrium is reached. So a couple of years ago, I think in 2019, actually, um, Seth Lloyd from MIT and, and uh, the group over at Xanadu had this idea of quantizing GANs um, and we introduced this Q GANs. Uh, and what they thought of was that um, in classical learning with GANs, when you have neural network architectures, for example, the aim is to adjust the weights and the biases of these neurons uh, to find an optimal kind of learning strategy where, term where learning can terminate. And in the quantum case, what we can assume is we can supply, instead of the generator and the discriminator, uh, we can supply, uh, being neural networks, we can have uh, parameterized quantum circuits. Um, and with these parameterized quantum circuits, we can optimally tune um, their rotation angles or their parameters. And this is a, somewhat of a good idea is because we know that um, in, within quantum information processing, we have this ability of kind of uh, performing manipulations of, of matrices of sparse low rank matrices um, in, in time, which is better than what you would do with classical resources. So there is some implication here that a quantum GAN can exhibit some potential advantage um, over uh, trying to figure out a distribution over a classical GAN where the object of the game is to reproduce statistics um, from making a bunch of me measurements on very high dimensional data sets. So what have we been using quantum GANs for, right? So I've been exploring this um, idea of generative modeling. Um, and the motivation here is to learn a particular probability distribution from a bunch of finite samples that we have. Um, and you can think of one reason why you might wanna do this. Imagine um, you're, you, wanna, you wanna do supervised learning and you're limited by the amount of training data you have and you wanna generate a bunch of more data so you can attach a GAN to your training um, algorithm or your, or your workflow or your pipeline. Um, which generates samples which look like the real probability distribution. Um, the, if you're interested in the math, the loss functions are at the bottom. Um, this work is kind of heavily inspired by uh, a paper that came out again in 2019 where a bunch of researchers at IBM um, particularly focused on this problem that I'm talking about um, of learning probability distributions and loading them into quantum states. Um, but I wanted to kind of show you some of the algorithmic primitives and how the algorithm looks like in Coda, right? So you, you have this ansatz, which you can define by a bunch of qubits and layers. Um, it's as easy to add a bunch of gates um, as it is in whatever fr framework of um, quantum computing you want to use, whether that's Qiskit, Penny Lane, whatever. Um, and you can see what, what kind of quantum circuits we're working with. Again, this is a very small scale demonstration. So we're using three qubits here. Uh, but at the end is the is the quantum call that you make, right? It's the algorithmic primitive that's predefined for you, which is get fake data. And you just provide it with a bunch of arguments that you've defined it with the ansatz, um, with what backend you wanna run on, so on and so forth. And, um, and this is what the results look like. So these are a bunch of hyperparameters. Um, so we have three qubits, two layers. We're using a particular ansatz. Um, and, and in this case, what we're doing is we're not, um, we're not uh, substituting, substituting the discriminator for a parameter, parameterized quantum circuit. Uh, the discriminator is classical. So the discriminator is a classical neural network. The generator is a parameterized quantum circuit. So you can have hybrid Q GANs as well, where you have some classical and some quantum uh, within the setup. Um, and you can see here that if your initial source of data is, is normally distributed around some uh, mean with a given uh, uh, standard deviation, as learning progresses, um, as shown by the number of epochs over here, uh, the distribution starts to capture more and more um, of, of the true, tr true data distribution. And one can define certain metrics like the Wasserstein distance or, or the relative entropy between the two uh, distributions 
to determine how close the true distribution is to the generated distribution. And you can see here that this clearly isn't exactly as uh, what, we would, what we would hope. And that's because this work is unfinished. It's still continuing. I'm facing a bunch of problems with um, my algorithm getting stuck in um, barren plateaus. The generator's loss isn't decreasing, for example. Um, and the fact that this is only a three qubit problem. So if I wanted to kind of make it more richer, if I added a bunch of extra gates, um, which can explore the full Hilbert space, um, rather than being restricted to a particular set, a particular part of the Hilbert space, that would potentially alleviate the problem. Um, so hopefully I can kind of share some interesting results um, uh, by the next time I speak on this uh, uh, symposium. Um, but yeah, I hope you kind of um, found our work in Coda interesting, um, some of the work I've been doing, um, and hopefully we can um, we can get Coda in your hands pretty soon so you guys can also start working on it and, and tell us what you think and, and give us some feedback. Thank you for listening. Uh, welcome any questions that you may have.